Today, we're going to be doing things a little bit differently. Console or computer? Apart from this time, what one really is better value when you only have £10 to spend? Hi guys, I'm Owen, otherwise known as TechQuen, and as the second half in this competition, I get to see whether I can build a £10 PC to beat Budget's £10 console. So, if you want to join me in my journey, make sure to check out my channel in the description below, and I'll see you guys over there. Goodbye. Right, so let's get right into things. With a budget of £10, I figured I'd aim for around the Xbox or PS2 style territory as I was probably not going to be lucky enough to get an Xbox 360 or something around that level of power because all the boot fairs are pretty much closed up around me and that cuts out some of the best deals in my area. So that left me with a choice of Gumtree, Spock and eBay, which led to me making a few calls and texts where I promptly ended up with some of the worst sellers in existence who couldn't quite click that I actually wanted to buy what they were selling. This was up until I made an offer on an eBay listing it was a completely out of the blue thing to have happen, £5 for a non-working, or supposedly non-working, Xbox console. And at this stage I was willing to take a gamble, as the only issue they mentioned was that the tray gets stuck. They said it runs games, turns on, they just wanted to list it as non-working in case someone wanted to try and get a refund. So after a few days waiting on the post, what actually ended up arriving? Well, this right here is an absolutely massive box of stuff, and what can only be described as a plethora of goodies and an absolutely ungodly smell emanating from somewhere within the box. However, I was able to see plenty of games scattered around, what appeared to be a rather dirty looking steering wheel, as well as a crystal Xbox and controller. And I mean, let's be honest here, even if this doesn't work, well, look what we've actually managed to get, considering that I didn't even need these, I was more just trying to get a hold of a console. Maybe the seller just wanted it all gone, probably why they just threw it all in the box. But then again, an original Xbox, well, they're not exactly selling for big money yet. I've picked these up for the change I've got in my pocket from charity shops, boot fairs, local listings. So it's no surprise that we managed to get one shipped to the door for under £10. But the question remains, did it actually survive shipping? I mean, the box isn't actually in the best of states. So I'm just gonna plug in a controller. I know this controller works. I'm not testing the current controller yet. And uh, I'm just gonna try putting in a game because this seems to be working despite listed as for parts or not working. So I think that's a Samsung drive, which would explain why it's a bit sticky, but we can fix that. And I'm just gonna throw in a game because this is pretty much a brand new disc. At least it was sold to me as pretty much brand new disc. So if it can read this, we might even have a working DVD drive, which would mean we've got a fully working Xbox. So we'll see what happens. Because I've picked up Xboxes this cheap before, and I've had them working, so this is not exactly the most exciting deal in the world, but yeah, there you go. It's even reading DVDs. Wow, there you go. That's actually really impressive, right. Let's get on with the rest of the video. Right, so we now know that the console works, and we know it seems to be reading discs and actually playing games. About standard for a console in this price range, even one listed as four parts, these are not expensive consoles, and that's exactly what I love about them. But what exactly are the specs of the original Xbox? Because, you know, we're going up against a £10 PC here, and I'd expect that to be fairly powerful. But the Xbox might be old, but it's not exactly a non-powerful little block. So, ultimately, the major specs can be seen in my full feature-length video actually on the original Xbox, but as a quick breakdown for the video, this is actually a really powerful little console featuring a Celeron and Pentium 3 style CPU, 64 megabytes of DDR-based RAM, and an 8GB IDE-based hard drive, which allows for caching and other advanced features. The best part of all are the GeForce 3 and GeForce 4 hybrid-style GPU it's got going on, 
and it just makes for a pretty powerful little box. The Xbox consoles are fairly hardy and they don't tend to get too hot or have anything wrong with them, other than a slightly subpar DVD drive on certain models, which are mostly the early Thompson drives which no longer work. Fortunately though, our drive as we've seen works absolutely fine. The only thing you do need to watch out for is the clock capacitor, which can usually go wrong on the older Xboxes. Fortunately, we actually have a V1.6 here, which is actually the latest revision of Xbox, which no longer has this issue. It just also has a worse encoder, but really we're not going to get into the depths of it because that's not going to affect us with the games we're playing or what we're going to be using the system for. You get the idea though, pretty awesome specs and for the money spent, a lot of games will actually be optimised for this set of hardware, which should give it a slight boost over a comparing computer. Hopefully. Just just hope that console optimization on this old brick can carry it through against a computer. Surely that must account for something. Well, my console did actually come with some component cables thrown in, as well as some composite cables, meaning if I want to use this on a HD TV then I can, and if I want to use it on a CRT TV then I can do that as well. Now, I know I've already set this system up before and it was already up and running, but that just goes to show how one of the main aspects that I have over Owen's PC is already coming into play. It is the peak of plug and play consoles. All it needs is one power cord and then just means plugging into a television. That is all you need to do. That is the extent of our setup. Admittedly, our DVD drive can be a bit sticky at times, but nothing that tapping on the top of it won't fix. And to play most things, well, you just put in the disc. There's no operating system installs, there's no drivers, there's no faffing about. It's just good old fashioned plop in a game and play it. But talking about that, how exactly is the gaming part? That's one thing we're actually all here for. Let's break this down. We have to pick three games to show off the power of our respective platforms, whether it's in terms of uniqueness, graphics, frame rate, whatever we want really, whatever can sell the purchase of a £10 showdown. Can my Xbox do it? Can the computer do it? And why should that compel you to buy it? Because ultimately this is about the gaming in this section. And then of course we have three comparing benchmarks, which of course includes Morrowind because it's on PC and Xbox, GTA San Andreas for the same reasons, and Half-Life 2 for once again the exact same reasons. But before we touch on the three games to compare, what did I actually pick to tell you the power of the original Xbox console? Let's get right into it with my first title, Forza Motorsport, an Xbox exclusive that didn't see any release on PC until recent years with Forza Horizon 3 and 4 I'm pretty sure. Really though, the first one remains only on the original Xbox. And I do have to say it's got phenomenal graphics and gameplay for an early 2000s game and you can also rip your CDs and music to the console and use these in game if you really want. If I had anything non-copyrighted I'd probably show it to you but unfortunately I can't. And really you don't even get that feature on PC or even on a modern console. The game runs at a constant locked 30fps and will never drop any frames at all, trust me I have tried. Personally I think that the game can be a little bit challenging compared to some of the modern titles, but with the mechanics as sharp as they are this isn't a problem. You've got customizations, tons of cars, tons of tracks, tons of challenges, all crammed onto a little Forza 1 disc. And that is something you definitely won't be getting on a computer. Second of all, another Xbox exclusive, one that is highly underrated, and one that I've probably spoken about a few times but most of you will have never heard of. That game is of course Phantom Crash, and all I have to say is, mech battling in an arena with a Forza style upgrade system, money earned for either picking up cash drops or taking out other mechs, a fantastic soundtrack that you unlock as you progress if you feel like spending your cash on it, you can customise that to play in battles, and the graphics can be a bit muddy in certain areas, but there is so much untapped potential in this game and this genre. And although it's sort of had a sequel on the PS2, 
it's not really the same game. It just doesn't give me the same vibes. I would really like to see a modern game take these core concepts and modernize them. And it just oozes early 2000s cool. It's a highly underrated gem that can only be played on the original Xbox. And yes, it can be repetitive, but the progression system keeps you coming back for more. Performance wise, it does stay at a perfect locked 30 FPS. It just doesn't have frame skip enabled, so there is some minor slowdown. I'm just unable to show this in terms of figures. But it doesn't make much difference, and it's only when things get very intense. Finally, where else would we be other than the one final game I'm going to use to try and sell you the Xbox console? The one, the only, Fable The Lost Chapters. One of the best games of all time, and genuinely one of the best games just on any platform ever, whatever you can play it on. Maybe I am a little bit biased, as I have a... biased? Biased, as I have a lot of nostalgia for this game, and I also do speedrun it from time to time. But, you know, the game is so legitimately impressive in every way imaginable. The soundtrack is awe-inspiring, and it doesn't matter what you do. The world is so beautifully crafted, with so many small details. It just doesn't matter what you want to do. You can explore, you can do anything. You can pretty much play the game however you want to play it. Want to play through with nothing but brute force? Go for it. Want to use nothing but magic? Absolutely doable, do it. Want to play through the entire game with nothing but a bloody stick? Do it. Actually, don't do that one. I've done it once before. It was genuinely painful. And the only way to play through with a controller is actually right here on the Xbox. You can't play through the Lost Chapters on PC with an Xbox controller. A casual style that suits the way the game should be played. It doesn't take itself too seriously, and neither should you. Right. Now onto the nitty gritty head to head against the PC. And why don't we start with one of the more impressive titles with Morrowind which is actually a pretty awesome experience on the console. I only actually own one, which is the standard edition, but if you're lucky enough, you can actually go out and get Game of the Year edition, which is, you know, the, all the DLC you'd find on the PC crammed onto the Xbox console. You've got your standard options to customize your gameplay experience. If you fancy turning off shadows as a graphics option, they've left that in there. Not that it really does make a great deal to performance, as the game does usually benefit most from a strong hard drive. In other words, as long as you haven't dropped your console, you end up seeing very good performance, as the game utilizes caching on the Z drive just to make sure it runs smoothly. It does have an uncapped frame rate, which means you can see up to 60 FPS. It's just the vast majority of the time, when you are in a town and city, do not expect to see this. Expect to see anywhere from 15 to 30 FPS. Although, the game does look alright. The beautiful reflections manage to make their way into the game. And although load times can be a tad long, and the game can look a bit muddy in the 480p resolution, I was surprised by how well it ran. I've spent far too long actually playing it, just because in the wilderness, you are not CPU bound. It is entirely up to the graphics chip and you do see 60 FPS a lot of the time, with quite heavy particle effects. It looked really good. But there you go. I don't think it'll beat the PC, though. Now, GTA San Andreas on the Xbox does actually get to boast itself as being one of the best console versions of the game. We have no removed songs, no cut content, and best of all, upgraded visuals over the original PS2 release. But it is stuck in the 480i resolution, unless we fancy messing about with loaders, which really I don't feel like doing. However, it does also run really well, doesn't really drop all too many frames, and maybe it doesn't exactly have the customization of the PC or the graphics, but I do have a special trick up my sleeve. All you need to do is plug in a second controller, and then you are actually on your way to playing GTA San Andreas with multiplayer couch co-op. Which is one thing that you can't do on PC. Although I suppose you've actually got on a multiplayer mod. But hey, this just involves me pushing play on another controller. But these... Well, these are all nothing compared to the legendary Half-Life 2. I will note first of all that this is pretty much the entire full game compressed down onto the original Xbox, and no matter what way you cut it, this is incredibly impressive. All the physics aspects, all the levels, they're all here. And all I have to do to run this release of the game is put in the disc. 
None of that downgrading nonsense that so many people have to mess with on PC, especially on lower end hardware nowadays. Now I will add that performance can be less than stellar, aiming for 30 FPS most of the time, usually hovering around a fully playable 20 to 30 FPS, very similar to Morrowind in the towns and cities. Just this time it looks far more impressive with visuals that are actually really still impressive today. There are the occasional stutters, and the game, as a fun fact, does make a mini install of itself on the Xbox cache drive to assist with loading. All in all, awesome stuff, and that's about far more in depth than I need to be for this. But all you need to hear is, yes, Half-Life 2 will work. It's just, on Xbox, it can be a bit slow in places. But it is still fully playable, and this is the main way I've actually ever played the game. Now, I know I'm not meant to be going down this route of overselling the Xbox console, but for how cheap these are, there are so many awesome games. Metal Gear Solid 2, Sega GT 2002, Jet Set Radio Future, Halo 1 and 2, Just Cause, Knights of the Republic 1 and 2, Odd World's Munch's Odyssey, and that is only beginning to scratch the surface of titles that exist for the original Xbox. So many great games either got their start here on the console or got their definitive versions ported to the Xbox. Not only are they cheap to pick up as a console, but the games right now are also incredibly cheap, and I cannot state that enough. Oh, and although Xbox Online is a bit of a hassle with X-Link Kai, there are projects to revive Xbox Live, and they are making great strides, and it should be as simple as the original setup was nearing 20 years ago. Not that anything can really beat the simplicity of just plugging in four controllers for some good old-fashioned couch co-op. The original Xbox is a pretty mediocre media player by today's standards. Yes, it does have a crystal clear output for DVDs, and yes, you can actually save your CDs to the hard drive and play them without the CD being installed. You can save a lot of CDs to that hard drive, and it compresses them down well. However, that is the extent of what you'll be doing unless you have access to an old memory stick and a game with a broken save system and with these you can quite quickly soft mod your system. Now I will say that this is an area where the console does take a turn for ease of use because this does require modding. Now all of a sudden though, the possibilities of the original Xbox as a media center make a bit more sense. It doesn't take up a great deal of space, it's very small actually. It has outputs to make it easy to connect to all kinds of televisions with resolutions as low as 480i all the way up to 720p and 1080i which makes actual output fairly crisp on even the most modern of televisions and even older CRTs which is the main reason I keep an original Xbox around. It was the one area that the Xbox still gets praise for today. It can output a very clean analog signal. Right, so let's get this out of the way. With the Xbox's local media playback, it does support DVDs and it will run them in proper RGB quality. So if you want a decent retro DVD player, the Xbox isn't a bad shout. God knows it looks far better than the PS2 does in my experience, as this thing can actually output colours without it going all funny all of a sudden. The only thing my one seemed to do is struggle a bit more with scratch discs, but that was the only weakness I noticed with that. Local content stored on the hard drive also worked alright. 480p could be decoded in virtually all formats, and 720p could be managed if it was in an XVID or DivX format. But 1080i was a bit too much and would often drop frames all over the place, and unfortunately, it's just, you know, too much for the poor Xbox to handle. You're not going to be doing anything near full HD. Next of all, though, was YouTube. And I managed to get this running with XBMC for Xbox, and it was tough, and I had to reduce the quality all the way down to 480p to get it to run smoothly, but we were able to watch some classic budget builds content, all streamed and encoded on the original Xbox. The plugin is around three years out of date and was a little bit unhappy and slow, but then again, YouTube was never really intended to be run on these kind of specs, and I still find that pretty damn impressive. But one of our final tests was meant to be Netflix, and that's a no-go on here, you are not going to be able to do that. Maybe I could find a way to stream it to the Xbox via a local server, but at that stage it's not the Xbox doing the work, it's just streaming from somewhere else that's playing it. The main thing that the Xbox is going for it is size and a nice UI with XBMC.
and you can also use the DVD controller if you've got one to control them both, which makes it quite nice as an actual media center box. Now, this is a tough one for me, I will admit. The one strength of a PC is its do-anything aspect that you really just don't get with a console, even when it's modded. However, I did manage to get around this in a few ways. It's just not great. I opted to install a fork of XDSL, which is ironic considering running Linux on a Microsoft console is just funny. And once things were up and running, they were actually not that slow. It was just a 64 megabytes of RAM and Pentium 3 type of experience. Web browsing was a little bit of a tough one. I used the built-in Firefox browser and was able to get around to most sites like Google. And if you didn't mind a text-only view, then even Wikipedia would work. However, tougher ones like eBay were fairly cruel on my meager amount of RAM and CPU usage. And they could either load extremely slowly with missing formatting, and they would work, or they would just straight up crash the browser. As it stands though, the internet was still fully achievable on a little original Xbox. Word processing and typing, it was much easier to stop inflicting pain on myself and use, I don't know, maybe a keyboard, but instead I opted to use the controller still. However, those also do work, you can achieve word processing and typing, and connectivity wise I could FTP into the Xbox from my PC to access files, but I don't think the Xbox will be doing much in the way of network monitoring, or, you know, anything network related. Although it did pop up on my network and I could network into it and do that type of things, it just isn't really the type of thing you want to be messing around with on your network nowadays. Still though, a £10 console probably isn't your best bet for day-to-day -day usage, but hey, maybe Owen's PC caught on fire or something, and we can hope that the Xbox didn't and that makes it better at day-to-day -day usage or something. We can only hope. So, only a brief segment to close up on, and I can't exactly find much to redeem the Xbox in terms of upgradability. I mean, the most common thing to recommend would be a hard drive upgrade, which can help with load times and performance, and it's not actually a hard thing to do. I've even SSD modded my own Xbox that I do use day to day, and it can be a really nifty mod. Graphics wise, I can make no change at all, that is pretty much going to stay as is. RAM can be upgraded to 128 megabytes, which can be awesome for homebrew and media stuff. And even more obscure as an upgrade is upgrading the CPU to a 1.4 GHz Pentium 3. I for one lack the skills to do this, and it can hurt compatibility with certain games unless you patch them. It's more of a homebrew side of an upgrade, but it can be a really cool upgrade to do. It's just difficult, unlike a computer, where most of the time you just end up slotting something in and installing drivers. Right, so I think that about sums up my £10 console experience I've had. And honestly, I think I've chosen a pretty good gaming setup. I know I might not have the highest resolutions, but I do have some awesome exclusives. I have the plug and play aspects that you just lack on a computer. And in fact, as much as I'm trying to sneak in as much as I can, I'm pretty sure I can get away with this. There is so much in the way of emulation and homebrew. Plenty of emulators are optimized for this set of hardware in the original Xbox. I can get away with PlayStation emulation, Nintendo 64 emulation, it's awesome stuff. Retro games look phenomenal on a CRT via the Xbox's crystal clear output. And this can all be achieved via a simple soft mod, which is so easy to do. Most games are incredibly smooth and do not have any real frame drops, but at the end of the day, it's a console. I am very limited by my specs, I am limited by day-to-day -day usage. So you'll have to go and find out what Owen's got a hold of, and then maybe next week, we'll see who made the better choice. And I'm sure we'll put up a poll for you guys to decide. So please go over and check out Owen's video, I can assure you it is really interesting to see what he picked up. And then after that, we'll have a poll open and you guys can vote on what you thought was the best PC or Xbox console. I don't know. <laughs> but seriously, thanks very much for watching. Hope you've enjoyed it and have a good night. Toodles. Owen's video, Techwin's video, should be featured down in the card over in the bottom right. Uh, please do click it and check it out. And of course, do vote so we can know what you thought was a better buy. As honestly, I think we're pretty close.